Well, now that we're comfortable with some key concepts of quantum mechanics, we can talk about a really important topic for semiconductors. The topic of this lecture is density of states. So let me remind you that we have these valence bands that is mostly filled. There's a top of the valence band and a bottom of the valence band that is so far down that we don't have to worry about it. We have a conduction band that consists of a set of states that are mostly empty. There's a bottom of the conduction band. There's a top of the conduction band that we generally don't need to worry about because it's so high in energy. It's going to be important for us to know now how the states are distributed within these bands. They're not uniformly distributed within energy. Now, we know that most of the empty states in the valence band, the holes, are near the top of the valence band. Most of the electrons in the conduction band are near the bottom of the conduction band. So we only really need to be worried about how the states are distributed in energy near the edges of the band. That's what our focus will be in this lecture. Okay. The key quantity that we're going to be discussing is called the density of states. And it's simply a way to, to count the number of states between a certain energy and an energy plus dE. The number of states in that range is the density of states times the width of that energy range. So this density of states is the quantity that we will see in detail, we will make use of in detail in the next unit. We want to learn how to appreciate what it is and how to calculate it for semiconductors in this lecture. We're going to take a simple description of energy versus crystal momentum. And this, these simple descriptions work near the top of the valence band and near the bottom of the conduction band. And that's going to be adequate for most semiconductor work. So let's begin by thinking about a large chunk of semiconductor crystal with a volume omega, with a length Lx in the x direction, Ly in the y direction, Lz in the z direction. Okay, so this is, let's think of this as a large but finite volume that, it, that we have carved out of an infinite bulk volume. Well, there's going to be a finite number of states because the states come from atoms and there are a finite number of atoms in this volume. We want to count the states. There are different ways of doing this. They end up all giving you the, the same answer. I'm going to take one particular way that makes a lot of physical sense. Since this is a piece of a volume from an infinite solid, I'm going to assume that at this end of the solid, and at the other end of the solid, the wave function is the same. We'll assume periodic boundary conditions so that everything just repeats itself throughout all of space in the x direction, in the y direction, and in the z direction. Okay. Okay. So let's just look in the x direction. This is x equals zero. This is x equal Lx, which is we're going to measure things in units of the lattice spacing. So the capital N is the number of atoms and A is the lattice spacing. Well, we know what the solutions to the wave equation are in this region. They're these block functions. It's a periodic part times a wave solution. Okay. So at x equals zero, we have to have the same wave function at x equals L. And we know that the periodic part will be the same because that repeats itself at every lattice spacing. So this condition, imposing the periodic boundary conditions, leads us to conclude that e to the i kx times lx must equal 1 in order to satisfy these periodic boundary conditions. Well, we know that some integer number of 2 pi's, e to the i 2 pi, or some integer number of 2 pi's, will give us 1. So we have to require that kx times lx equals an integer number of 2 pi's. So the integer is 1, 2, 3. It just keeps repeating itself. Solving for kx, we see that kx is 2 pi over the length that we're doing all of our counting of states in times this integer j. If we plot that, we'll get a set of states. So Whenever we apply boundary conditions to a wave function, we get a set of discrete states. We now have a set of discrete k states. The difference is that we're thinking about this. It's not a particle in a box problem. This is a very large volume. These are very finely spaced states. Okay. Now, we're going to ask the question, in some range dk, 
How many states are there? Well, we know that each of the states are spaced by 2 pi over Lx. So the number of states in that region is the width of the region, dk, divided by the spacing between states. Then we'll multiply by 2, because each state can hold an electron with spin up or with spin down. And this quantity, we will say, is the density of states in k space times the width of the region in k space. So we conclude that the density of states in k space is the length that we're doing the counting in divided by pi. This is in one dimension, okay? And remember, we always have to uh, remind ourselves to account for the factor of 2 for spin for our electrons. Now, we can also look at this result a little more closely. The length is some integer number of lattice constants. That means I can insert n times a here for lx, and then I have kx is 2 pi over a, the integer j divided by the number of atoms in this region n, capital N. Now, as I let j get bigger and bigger, eventually it will hit n. When it hits n, then the phase of this exponential has gone from 0 to 2 pi. If I continue to let j increase, I'm just going around the circle again and getting another set of results that are completely equivalent. So, the unique solution to this equation are between k equals 0 and k equals 2 pi over a. Uh, that means the maximum k that can occur is 2 pi over a. This is similar to the Brillouin zone that we talked about in the previous lecture. There is a region in k space of width 2 pi over a in which the unique solutions are found. We can shift this region. Sometimes it's usually convenient to shift it so that we go from minus pi over a to plus pi over a, but the width of that region over which we have a unique set of uh, answers is 2 pi over a. This is the Brillouin zone. Okay. All right, so we've gone through the counting in 1D, and we've seen that the density of states in k-space is 2 for spin, L over 2 pi, so the result is L over pi. If we were to do this in 2D, if we had a 2D material, a quantum well that we've made with a semiconductor heterostructure or whatever, the density of states would be 2 for spin, but now they're spaced L over 2 pi in the x direction and L over 2 pi in the y direction. So we get L squared, which is the area, over 2 pi squared, which is 4 pi squared. So when we reduce this, we get A over 2 pi squared. In three dimensions, we have the factor of 2 for spin. Okay. Uh, now we have states spaced in x, y, and z. Lx times Ly times Lz is the volume of this material that we're doing the counting of our states in. This is 2 pi cubed, so we get omega over 4 pi cubed. Okay. In 1D, the width of the region in k-space is dk. In 2D, it's dkx, dky. In 3D, it's dkx, dky, dkz. It's a volume in k-space. All right, now the important thing to point out is that this applies to any type of band structure, any type of E of k. It's independent of E of k. The states are, the density of states in k-space is the same no matter what the material is. Okay. Now we will more commonly ask ourselves a different question. We will ask ourselves the question, how are the states distributed in energy? Then it gets a little bit different. So let's assume we have a parabolic band. Energy is h bar squared k squared over 2m. This would be the bottom of the conduction band here. We've seen that the states are spaced uniformly in k. At any particular k, I have a corresponding energy. If you simply map these states to their corresponding energies, you can see now that they are not distributed uniformly in energy. How they are distributed will depend on the shape of the E versus K curve. Okay. So what we're going to want to do now is to figure out how these states are distributed in energy and find the density of states in energy space. What we will do is to count the states in K space, map them into a corresponding region in energy, 
and we will relate the number of states in this region in k-space. The same number of states have to occur in this region in energy space, and that will allow us to define a density of states in energy. I'm going to write this as d prime of e. de is the number of states in that region, and that's in this region right here. And that's equal to nk dk, the density of states in k-space, times the width of the region in k-space. That's the number of states in this region of k-space, and they are the same. So by using this relation, we will be able to deduce from the known density of states in k-space, the density of states in energy space. So let's do that. So the first example, we will do it for a one-dimensional nanowire. These used to be academic exercises years ago. Today, they're real exercises because we can produce semiconducting nanowires, and we often need to know what the density of states is. We'll assume just a single subband. You recall that there are different subbands. Uh, if we assume a single subband uh, with an energy E sub n, then the kinetic energy is associated with the motion in the x direction. It's h bar squared kx squared over 2 times the effective mass. All right, so here's our problem. Here's our k in one dimension. Here's our region dk. We're going to map the states in that region to the corresponding regions in energy space. Well, we know the number of states in this region in k space. We've worked that out. It's n of k dk that is L over pi times the width of that region in k-space. That has to be the same total number of states in the, energy, in the corresponding energy range. That's d prime of E dE. Now I'm going to drop the prime. Typically, when we talk about density of states, we are interested in the density of states per unit length. You know, we're not interested in the actual number of states because it's sort of arbitrary. If I take double the length, I'll get double the number of states. So d, 1d of e, the density of states that we're going to compute, is the density of states per unit length. So I have to divide by L. Okay. The units then are going to be the number of states, not really a unit, per unit energy, per unit meter for the length. Those are the units of density of states. All right, so now we are prepared to calculate the 1D density of states. This is the number of states in energy space. This is the number of states in the corresponding K space. We have our relation between the K number of states in K space. We have our dispersion. We can put it all together. Uh, this comes from the density of states in K space. We can now use the dispersion to compute DE from this relation. We can also compute k from the dispersion, and we can then uh, compute dE in terms of energy, plug it all into this relation, and we find the density of states in energy is 1 over pi h-bar square root of effective mass over 2 times the energy with respect to the bottom of the conduction band. This applies, of course, only when the energy is greater than the bottom of the subband because there are no states below that. So this is the density of states, and we can pick the first subband, second subband, third subband, or whatever. Now, I should just point out, we've done the counting over here for plus kx, and we found the number of states that are in that corresponding energy range. The band structure is symmetric. There's an equal number of states over here at minus kx that map into the same energy range. So I need to multiply by 2. And this is my final answer. This is the density of states, the number of states between E and E plus dE as a function of energy, and we've derived the result that we were after. Remember, we've assumed parabolic bands, so the answer could be different if we had a much different band structure. So in general, we'll have multiple subbands. We'll have a density of states for each one of those. Note that the density of states goes to infinity at the bottom of the subband when E is equal to E sub n. And we'll have a series of those. If this is the first quantized level, the particle in a box type solution, we'll have a density of states associated with the electrons that are in that subband. If this is the bottom of the second subband, the quantized state, then we'll have a density of states associated with that as well, and on and on.
All right, that's 1D. Let's see if we can do it for two-dimensional electrons. We can produce two-dimensional electrons by artificial semiconductor structures. There are also two-dimensional materials these days that people are quite interested in. So consider a thin semiconducting slab of thickness T. The electrons are confined in the Z direction, so I'll have particle in a box, subbands associated with that. The electrons are free to move in the XY plane. And we would like to count the states within this area A. We're going to assume again that the bands are parabolic. So the energy is the bottom of the subband plus h bar squared times k in the xy plane squared divided by 2 times the effective mass. All right. So let's have a look at that. We're going to approach it the same way. We'll take the density of states times the width and energy range. We'll map that to the corresponding number of states in the k-space range. And the way we'll do this is we will assume a two-dimensional k-space. So there is a, a parabolic band, so energy is h-bar squared k-squared over 2m. That's this circle. And we'd like to know how many states are there between k and k plus dk. The red ring around here is width dk. The area of that region that we're asking to count the states in is the circumference of the circle, 2 pi k times the thickness of that little ring, which is dk. And we're asking how many states are there in that red area. Well, each state has an area of 4 pi squared over a, and as we've seen when we apply the periodic boundary conditions. And then we multiply by 2 for spin. Okay, so when we do this calculation, we have a over 2 pi squared. We're dividing by a because we're going to compute the density of states per unit area. Okay, and then we have the volume of k space, 2 pi k dk. All right, we use our dispersion to compute 2 pi k dk in terms of energy. We do a little bit of math and we end up with this simple expression for the two-dimensional density of states. Note that the two-dimensional density of states is proportional to mass divided by pi h-bar squared. Of course, these states only exist if we're above the bottom of the subband. Okay, so the density of states in 2D then is quite different from the state's density of states in 1D. Uh, let's do 3D. And most of the course, we will be concerned with three-dimensional semiconductors. So we'll assume a simple dispersion, parabolic bands, the constant energy surfaces are spheres. We will equate the number of states in an energy range to the number of states in the corresponding k range. We now have a volume of k space, d cubed k. We have computed the density of states in k space, so we know that. We will equate that. The volume, the, the volume of k-space that we're going to do the counting in then is the surface area of the sphere, 4 pi k squared, times the thickness of a, of a ring around that sphere, dk. So that's the volume of k-space that we are counting the states in. Well, now we'll make use of the dispersion, and we will express k squared dk in terms of energy. When we, do, when we do that algebra, we end up finding that the density of states is proportional to the square root of the effective mass times the effective mass, and it varies as the square root of energy. So we've calculated the density of states now for one-dimensional electrons, two-dimensional electrons, and three-dimensional electrons, all under the assumption that the bands are parabolic. Now, things can get a little more complicated. I'll just mention this, although we won't go into the calculation. Recall that uh, the band structure of silicon is, the bands are parabolic, but they have different curvatures in different directions. And there are six bands at the same energy. So the constant energy surfaces, the minima of the conduction bands are located along a 100 direction, or these equivalent 010 direction, 001 direction. There are six of these valleys along these six directions. And they have different effective masses in the x and the y direction. So that band structure is a little more complicated. We've been assuming a simple spherical band centered at k equals zero. We could compute the density of states for silicon as well. 
It would be a little more complicated calculation, but it's something that you go through in, in slightly more advanced courses. I'll simply give the answer. You can wrap everything together and you can make it look like our simple result if we express, if we define a quantity that we will call the density of state's effective mass. This is not a real effective mass. The real effective masses are related to the curvature of E versus K. But this is a definition such that if we use it in our simple spherical band approximation, we'll get the correct answers and the correct densities of states. So when we are computing the density of states in a semiconductor, we have to be careful in this formula to use the appropriate density of states effective mass. If it's a simple spherical semiconductor centered at k equals zero, it's just the effective mass associated with the curvature of the band. If it's a more complicated material like silicon, it is a more complicated quantity. So you should re remember that. All right, so some things that we should take away. This is the expression for the density of states. It's worth remembering that the density of states varies as the three halves power of the effective mass. So if I'm dealing with a semiconductor that has a light effective mass, I know it's going to have a small density of states. It's also worth understanding that it varies as the square root of energy. Okay, so as I increase in energy, I will get more and more states. So for example, if we look at silicon, it has a much higher density of states effective mass than gallium arsenide. We would expect then the density of states of silicon to be significantly higher than gallium arsenide. So just to summarize, we've derived the density of states in 1D, 2D, and 3D, assuming parabolic bands. If we plot them, we can see that the density of states in 1D goes as 1 over the square root of energy. When the electrons get down near the bottom of the subband, the density of states goes to infinity. In 2D, there are states above the bottom of the first subband, and the density of states is independent of energy above the bottom of that subband. In 3D, the density of states is zero at the bottom of the conduction band, and then it increases as the square root of energy. So these are quantities that we will make significant use of in uh, the next unit of this course. As an exercise, if you'd like to test yourself and see if you understand the basic concepts here, compute the density of states for graphene. Graphene does not have a parabolic band structure. It is a 2D material, but it will have a density of states that is significantly different than the 2D density of states for parabolic bands that we just worked out. The answer will be something like this. The density of states will increase linearly with energy as we go above E equals zero and as we go below E equals zero. So you might see if you can derive that result and convince. If you can do that, then you understand the process of deriving a density of states for any band structure. All right. We've covered a lot of ground, but we've introduced this important quantity that we're going to need to, to use again and again throughout the course. The quantity is the density of states, and it's one that we're going to frequently use. The important points to remember are that the density of states depends on the dimension of the semiconductor. We have different densities of states in 1D, 2D, and 3D. The density of states in k-space is constant and does not depend on band structure. But the density of states in energy space does depend on band structure and can be quite different for different band structures. For three-dimensional bulk semiconductors with parabolic bands, it's worth remembering that the density of states is proportional to the three halves power of effective mass and to the square root of the energy above the bottom of the conduction band. So these are some important concepts. The quantum mechanical background that we've had uh, helps us understand where these come from. We will make significant use of them, especially the 3D density of states in the next unit. Thank you.